Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us. Last night was the first of two debates for the Democratic candidates for president. Some jokingly called it the debate for vice president. Though Elizabeth Warren was there and did well, it also opened the door for people like Julian, Julian Castro and let others shine a bit, like de Blasio. The debate made it crystal clear how the left and grassroots have pushed the Democratic Party further to the left as the defining issues came up during the course of that evening, perhaps the future of the party itself may be defined by this push to the left. This is especially true on curbing corporate power, taxing wealth, climate change, the working class, healthcare, racial justice. Things are shifting. Well, they really will see. And we'll look at all of this uh, as much as possible with our guests today in the time that we have. <laughs> We're here with Dr. Kimberly Moffat, Associate Professor and Chair of Language, Literacy, and Culture at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Her latest book is Michelle Obama and the Flotus Effect. Good to have you here, Kimberly. Thank you. And Dr. Lester Spence, Professor of Political Studies and Africana Studies at Johns Hopkins University. His latest book is Knocking the Hustle. And Lester, good to see you. Good to see you. So let's begin this way. Let's, let's open up with this opening segment uh, of uh, Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren? Yes. <laughs> Probably forgot her first name. Uh, Elizabeth <laughs> Warren. And, and, and it's about questioning corporate America and this, what this means about the shift to the left and why everybody's taking these positions. We'll hear her, and then in a minute we'll also hear a bunch of other candidates on the same issue. Who is this economy really working for? It's doing great for a thinner and thinner slice at the top. <coughs> it's doing great for giant drug companies. It's just not doing great for people who are trying to get a prescription filled. It's doing great for people who want to invest in private prisons, just not for the African Americans and Latinx whose families are torn apart, whose lives are destroyed, and whose communities are ruined. It's doing great for giant oil companies that want to drill everywhere, just not for the rest of us who are watching climate change bear down upon us. When you've got a government, when you've got an economy that does great for those with money and isn't doing great for everyone else, that is corruption, pure and simple. We need to call it out, we need to attack it head on, and we need to make structural change in our government, in our economy, and in our country. Now, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have kind of taken on the role of really going after corporations. It's been a big push in this country uh, from the left and from the grassroots to really take on corporate power and the 1%. Uh, but I think it's important also to listen to how these other candidates, a kind of group of them, also spoke to this and, and how this may be defining this campaign against Trump, the Republicans, the right, and what it really means. Right now, we have a system that favors those who can pay for access and outcomes. That's how you explain an economy that is rigged to corporations and to the very wealthiest. A $2 trillion tax cut that favored corporations while they were sitting on record piles of cash and the very wealthiest in this country at a time of historic wealth inequality. I think we have a serious problem in our country with corporate consolidation. And you see the evidence of that in how dignity is being stripped from labor. And we have people that work full-time jobs and still can't uh, make a living wage. We see that because consumer prices are being raised by pharmaceutical companies that often have monopolistic holds on drugs. I want to make it clear, this is supposed to be the party of working people. Yes, we're supposed to be for a 70% tax rate on the wealthy. Yes, we're supposed to be for free college, free public college for our young people. We are supposed to break up big corporations when they're not serving our democracy. This Democratic Party has to be strong and bold and progressive. And in New York, we've proven that we can do something very different. We can put money back in the hands of working people. And let me tell you, every time you talk about investing in people and their communities, you hear folks say there's not enough money. What I say to them every single time is there's plenty of money in this world. There's plenty of money in this country. It's just in Thank the wrong you. hands. Come we in. Democrats have to fix that. So there we go. Lester. <laughs> so I'm going uh, to so to get a sense about what type of shift this is, I'm going to pick on uh, the candidate that I'm familiar with, probably the most of the suite of candidates that we saw, see, uh, Cory Booker. So Cory Booker, when he was mayor of Newark, he basically turned over the Newark public schools to Facebook. Uh, I believe in the last presidential election, the, uh, no, not the, the, not the one four years ago, the one eight years ago, he critiqued 
uh, I believe, one of the, uh, at least somebody associated with the Democratic Party for going against, uh, going against private equity, because private equity was kind of a source of a lot of his own campaign funds. Um, but given the shift to the left, he can no longer maintain the same types of stances for corporate cons consolidation and for privatization that he once took for granted. Now, the thing is, it's complicated. So the bit that he was answering about there, he was asked specifically about Facebook and Google, and his answer moved away right. from Facebook and Google. There was a lot Google. of dancing last night. Right. Yeah, it was place. dancing, Lots but he dancing. moved in. He didn't talk right. about Facebook and Google. He talked instead right. about, about, uh, about pharmaceutical drug sales. But even in that case, I'm almost positive that you can look back to a vote that he, that um, one of his votes, where he voted actually against providing a kind of a, uh, the government actually getting into the process of buying, uh, buying drugs to make it cheaper for the consumer. But he's forced to at least rhetorically move more towards the, the, the place established uh, by Sanders and Warren, kind of as far as the candidates, and then the left more broadly. And so I think Probably. what they're doing is responding to what polling data shows in terms of giving us Elizabeth Warren as one of the front runners. And if she, as a front runner, is more to the left, then so too should we be in order to make sure we remain um, competitive in this process. But I think it's very short-sighted because what we need to be doing is thinking about what are some of the core values of that particular po party and the ideologies that they desire to see going going forward instead of being shifted by just a few candidates and making decisions on what does the entire population of their uh, of that uh, Democratic Party actually desire and look for. So before we can I get into some of the other issues here, uh, I'm curious, when you saw, when we saw what we saw last night in this few clips we just played right now, how significant, how real, how deep is this forced shift we call to the left. But in many ways, things we call to the left are, in a popular sense, or issues people care about, they just right. don't call them the left in our country, which is why they're being pushed there. The left is pushing to the left, but the people are just saying, we want medical care, we want decent housing, we want a good environment, we want good education. Um, so so but how deep is this? I mean, because you said earlier, uh, before we went on the air, Lester, that, you know, that, that sometimes you can go from the left, but then once you get in power, the center takes over. Mm -hmm. So uh, one way to look at this is kind of uh, attitudinally, right? So we actually know that majorities uh, that are based on sub, uh, public uh, opinion surveys, that majorities, uh, that a majority of Americans want a variety of things that we associate with the left, right? Um, like I think they want better health care, they want corporations to be more responsible, they want uh, uh, government to do more to deal with climate. Uh, they want uh, more, they want uh, certain forms of right, labor protections, right? Uh, and then there are a few other things too. Uh, what's relatively newer is they, there's actually a great deal of resentment. Like we talk about racial resentment often, yeah. um, but there's actually a great deal of resentment towards the wealthy, right? Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Spencer Piston, wrote a really wonderful book on class attitudes in American politics. And what he basically just did was took the standard surveys that political scientists and social scientists have been studying for years and actually started to mine them. Instead of questions about racism um, asked in different ways, he started to mine them for questions about class asked in different ways. And what he sees is that Consistently, there is a great deal of resentment towards, uh, towards what we call the 1%. So if you take those attitudes about policy, combine them with attitudes about the people who get most of the benefits from the policies we have now, we actually have the makings of a, de of a durable alliance that can actually shift the nation leftward in public policy and uh, in electing uh, in, uh, individuals to office and in remaking um, the relationship between the state and the market. However, okay. right, however, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, however, uh, that doesn't mean it's durable within the party. 
Okay. That's a very powerful point. Well, but, and, and my however is we are talking about a concept in which Americans don't like to deal with in the first place. And so the idea of expressing class in that way, admitting that we participate in class, is not what most Mer Americans are willing to do. We're not even willing to have the conversations about it. I, I, I don't know about that. I, I, what we can say is that Elites aren't willing to have this. Oh well, clearly, right? But, right. That, that, that right. doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that people aren't. But but when we look at the difference between the two parties and how working class is spread across both parties, mm -hmm. clearly what you're arguing is yes, there should be this unified alliance to address these issues because they are all being impacted. However, the moment you interject things such as immigration or reproductive justice or abortion, to be even more specific. Specific, that is when you start to see the divide and class becomes a non-issue. Well, 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 so here's another way to think about that, right? So one way to think about Trump's victory is that Trump, now, and again, it's complicated, but one way to read Trump's victory is as the working man is actually as somebody that the working man really, really, really narrowly defined, <laughs> right? Race, gender, mm -hmm. sexuality, ethnicity, et cetera. That, the, that he's the working man's candidate within the Republican Party. Now, granted, they did that wrong, but yeah. he, he was actually making populist arguments. Right. He, right. he became the white working man's... Yeah, yeah, yeah working man. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but I think there's interesting, Ryan had that great statement in the debate last night where he talked about uniting the working class across male and female, black, white, Latino, Asian, transgender, straight. Yeah. He, it was, it was, you know, he's an interesting character. Yeah, but he, he faded no into the background. He did fade. But I'm just saying some of the things he said were really pretty powerful when it comes to, because he represents a working class district. Right. And he was right. really kind of speaking And in a red state. So, so one of the other big issues here that I think that, that clearly is me battling a, a, a battleground in this election uh, will be health care and how we define health care. So let's take a look at what some of the candidates said about that and, and, and tackle this. Who here would abolish their private health insurance in favor of a government-run plan? Just a show of hands, starting off with. <laughs> All right, well. well health care is a basic human right, and I will fight for basic <laughs> human rights. Thank you. Getting to guaranteed, high-quality, universal health care as quickly and surely as possible has to be our goal. I do want to ask a follow-up on this one. Just to, be, just to be very clear, I'll give you 10 seconds. Would you replace private insurance? No, I, I think the choice is, is fundamental hey, to wait, wait. our I'm ability to get wrong. everybody yeah, care for. Private insurance is not working for tens of millions of Americans. When you talk about the co-pays, the deductibles, the premiums, the out-of-pocket expenses, it's not working. <laughs> that's How right. can you so, defend so for a those system that's not it's working. not working, they can choose Medicare. For the coronary workers in you Nevada who I listen to, who the negotiated for those working plans, for people. in my community, African Americans have a lower life expectancy because of poorer health care. And so where I stand is very clear. Health care is not just a human right, it should be an American right. It should be an American right. So this really got off. And plus, that, <laughs> the thing between Beto and uh, Beto and, uh, de and de Blasio mm -hmm. was really amazing. I mean, <laughs> Beto, uh, we can know about Beto later if we have time, but he really kind of, kind of took a nosedive again yes, last did. night. I don't, I don't know who that candidate was in Texas, but he certainly is <laughs> posting right now. But, um, <laughs> but let's talk about this health care piece. Again, this entire debate has been pushed in a place that was never there before. Mm -hmm. Obama kind of didn't even promise to pick up the option, didn't pick up the public option. And then since that moment, it's really been pushed further. Mm -hmm. Medicare for all. And people are trying to wrestle how they would do Medicare for all and not do away with private insurance. Um, and when I heard de Blasio and he talks about all these co-pays, all I want to say, yes, brother, I understand. <laughs> I do know, I hate that. So, I <laughs> <laughs> so talk about, about where, where you think this takes this debate and, and what people said. Kimberly, you want to begin? Um, I, I found it interesting that it was just Warren and de Blasio who that raised their, who hand. raised their right. hands right. and the other eight candidates um, kind of held firm to where they were. Um, I do think health care will be a major issue in 2020, that candidates um, as well as the general public is looking for an answer to this. And so even though Obama did not manage that 
um, to the best effect. Um, what I do think he did is he opened the door so that folks are like, this has to be resolved. We've got to do something different. What Trump has done is rolled us back a bit on these issues, but in particular, the Democratic Party is saying, we've got to keep pushing it, and that's what's going to um, help us return back to the White House. So let me add to this as you come into this, Lester. I mean, one of the things, if, if we watch what happened with Obamacare, uh, what we call Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and the difficulty it had getting through, and the resistance it had from the Republicans, the resistance it had from the right, the resistance it had from the pharmaceutical industry, the healthcare industry itself. Um, imagine the battle for Medicare for all. Yeah. But that's being taken up here, and how that might play out politically. So what I think uh, we discount is the ability of rhetoric to actually create majorities, right? So you, you use rhetoric to say, okay, this is where we are, but this is where we want to go. And then once you articulate that, and, uh, and, uh, once you articulate that, I mean, given all types of other stuff, then people can say, oh, wow, this is possible. I didn't know this was possible. Yes, we can fight for this. Yes, we should, right? Um, so what I think we're seeing now is something that can has, have the potential to create kind of a new imaginary around healthcare, because that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about within a very short time, we, um, and I disagree slightly with, uh, with, with Kim, and that I, I think uh, we can say that Obama's legislation created the space, but Obama didn't do it, right? Obama at no right. point in time articulated anything right. saying like, this is, right, well, this is, is what we- It is his legislation. Yeah, right, yeah. that this is what, where we want to go is this, but this is our halfway point. Right. What we're seeing now is actually the potential of, of a movement on this and a range of other issues where we could say, wow, this is where we want to go. We want healthcare as a human right. That's really a radical statement compared to where we've been going back uh, to, to, to uh, 92. And it's actually a, a telling moment that Warren, I'm not gonna really, to be fair, I'm, I'm, I'm trifling, but I'm not gonna, really gonna count <laughs> homeboy. Um, you talking about Booker? Yeah, not Booker. No, de Blasio. Uh, de, uh, de Blasio, I'm not gonna really gonna count De Blasio. Count de Blasio. He, 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 yeah, right, right. You know, that, that Warren was the only one to, Warren and de Blasio were the only ones to put their hand up. Right. Right. So if you look at corporate support in the Democratic Party, there are two candidates that the corporations are like, we don't want to give money to. We really don't want to support. It's Warren and it's Sanders. And it's telling that Warren was like, yo, it should be a human right. And we even see Booker, and we see Booker again trying to tack in her direction, but still, well, no, it's an American right. No, human right is a different, that's a different analytical concept, right? That's really important. An American, that's really important. It's an American right, that's right? Really important. So let's take this other, the other piece we're going to kind of look at here. Um, and the, the uh, immigration was really hot and heavy uh, in this conversation last night. So, and I think that's one of our most important issues for us to face. So what we're going to do here is that we are going to uh, let you think about what we just said here and come back in a second for another segment. And we come back for this segment, you'll have time to get something to drink, come back, sit down, put on your computer, watch the, whatever you're watching this on, and check out what comes next, which is immigration and some other very powerful closing arguments that they made, and what this says about the future Democrats and where they might be going in this first debate. And I'm here with two of my colleagues and dear friends, uh, Kimberly Moffat and Lester Spence, and we'll all be back. I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Take care, don't go away.